name is E.R. Anderson. Um, I'm coming to you live from Atlanta, Georgia. I am here on behalf of Karis Books and Karis Circle. We are not actually physically, of course, in the space of Karis Books, but Karis Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're 45 years old. And since 2011, it has been a dream of mine to have Cooper Lee come to Karis. Um, he and I met at the Lambda Literary uh, Emerging Writers Fellowship um, retreat. I see some of our fellow uh, writers on this uh, chat, which is awesome. Um, that was such a special, special opportunity um, and a special place. And since since that um, that retreat, we've gotten to host I think six or seven different people from from that class at Karis. So. Um, I am I am grateful to all that Lambda Literary does to foster queer and trans writing and art, um, and to foster connection across space and time. So there may be lots of other um, queer and trans folks who have gone through that program. If you're on the chat, uh, shout out your year. We'd love to hear uh, if you were there, um, because I feel really grateful at this moment when we are socially distanced. Uh, that even though we don't get to physically hang out and be in the same space, that actually a lot more people to be at this reading tonight um yeah. so it's actually kind of a cool thing um so you know feel free to shout out where you're where you're watching from we know obviously there's going to be folks from canada folks from the u.s but sometimes there's folks from other parts of the world too we're happy to have you here if you're ever uh in atlanta and we get to all be together again we hope that you'll come see us um and as always you know come visit us online we are really, really excited to be celebrating um, this pre pre publication opportunity with Cooper Lee Bombardier. So, Pass with Soul comes out on June 9th, um, but we're going to be taking pre orders. There's a button down at the bottom of your screen. You can order it right now. Um, support indies. We, you know, that's super important. Um, and as as you're listening to Coop Reed, you're going to want to um, to buy the book and celebrate uh, and have your own copy. I've asked Cooper to pick out a couple different sections, but before we get started, you know, one of the things that we, I wanted to just kind of start with from the beginning is just to say this book, um, this book is really a kind of litany of survival. And that's one of the things that I really loved about it. Um, you and I have a lot of sort of superficial biological, but like biographical and I guess biological facts in common. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, biographical facts in common and um, but really what I love and what I think is going to draw a very broad audience to this book is that it's about how you survive um, as a creative being and how you find how you hold true to your authentic self through trauma through waves of plagues um, and bad politics and you know interpersonal conflicts and all kinds of things and how you keep kind of coming back to authenticity to truth to censor um and so i think while it's very difficult that this book is coming out in this moment it's also a really wonderful time for this book to come out because it's going to help a lot of people i think to find that actually we've survived we culturally as queer and trans people have survived so much but also um we we have a lot a lot of um, deep history, uh, deep yeah. recent history uh, that gives us strength. So I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about kind of your framing of the book and then read a little bit from the early section and we'll talk a little more and we'll read some more and then get to some listener questions. Cool, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much. And thanks to Karis for hosting me and for you. It's great to connect with you again, of course. And, um, yeah, so uh, the the book kind of uh, I kind of conceived of putting it together as a memoir and essays, and you know, all loosely connected to the theme of masculinity and trans identity, and um, also through you know through the journey of becoming a writer. Uh, I was writing the whole time or whatever, but um, to me, there was a sense of writing myself into an identity, of writing as a place to create identity. And the identity of being a writer, I guess, um, is to me the biggest transition of the book, the sense of, of kind of moving towards how do I center my life around this? Um, so that's kind of um, how it came together. And um, 
you know, when I, I uh, approached Daughter with uh, a pitch for my book and, and it, I sent them the manuscript. It, I, I think of it, it was like this giant bale of hay. It was bulky and bristly and awkward. And I, you know, sent it over to them. And, and I feel that, uh, you know, the team at Daughter really kind of got what I was going for, but had a lot of vision the book and helped shape it and, um, and give it some narrative arc um, because some of the earlier pieces I wrote 20 years ago, you know? Um, and so I, I think in a lot of ways there was the, the um, way in which I developed as a writer, um, you know, the, the newest stuff or the, the, the stuff that's never been seen before in the book, um, you know, really is, is different than the, the stuff I was writing to do spoken word pre-Sister Spit and, and San Francisco. And, um, you know, so I wanted to kind of um, incorporate that flavor and also kind of um, to kind of look at how um, the utility of the writing changed too, as I wanted it to do different things. Um, yeah, I don't know, should I read a little bit from Boombox? Yeah. Um, I think my Aunt Mary is on the call, so, uh, um, and, and she had asked uh, about the, the pocket knife on the cover. This is my first pocket knife from when I was a little kid. <laughs> um, I think I was gifted it by my dad when I was five. And uh, yeah, so my Aunt Mary definitely saw it when we were um, out playing in the woods. We had tons of outdoor space. We grew up next door to each other and um, there was lots of woods that we all ran around and we had free reign, which I, th I feel like is a, something that maybe perhaps ended with my generation where you got to just get home from school and go outdoors and not be seen for several hours. And um, so th this, is, uh, this is about my childhood. It's called Boombox. I took one look at my new Boombox and I knew then and there that I would never be cool. The boom box was my parents gift to me on my 12th birthday and as the weather warmed from elgin damp spring to the humid murmurings of early summer in the south shore of boston i made tentative forays out into my neighborhood with my boombox as company the small chrome panasonic boombox was all of a foot long it had an am fm radio tuner along the top and a round silver knob at the center to the left of the radio dial lived a single round speaker the right side of the tinny boom box housed a rectangular marsupial flap into which, um, in which to insert eight track tapes. When I opened the boom box birthday gift, I understood on an intrinsic nonverbal frequency that it precluded any chance of me being perceived a cool kid. The kids who smoke cigarettes behind cumbies where their cool older siblings had long ago spray painted the word yes and bubble letter salute to that band and sold baggies of three J's for a five spot. The kids who wrote Ozzy across the knuckles of their hands in ballpoint and who blasted hard rock out of their normal boom boxes, the ones with two speakers and cassette players. Or the kids, the rare pioneers who listened to the percussive beats of early hip hop and practiced their backspins on pieces of cardboard. No, my categorization is something that hovered outside the parameters of cool was now cemented and unmovable. I saw the rectangular hole for the A-track cassette tapes and my future hopes for any scrap of coolness fell in. The asymmetry, imbalance, and awkward, heavy construction of the chrome and black boombox mirrored back a self-portrait in electronics form. All of my, all, <clears throat> sorry, all of the elements of my family dynamics, as I could best comprehend at age 12, were also framed within the boombox clunky chrome rectangle. Our young family's struggles and aspirations made loud drop shifts forward from working class to middle, like the track changes on the tapes. My parents were 34 years old with three children between the ages of one and 12. Mom cut hair at her kitchen table with Donahue yapping from a small TV on the counter. A microclimate of hair, bleach and Aquanet hovered over the house on the day she worked. As she was doing her own mother's weekly hairdo, the forbidden stench of cigarette smoke cloyed the air as well. My dad, the oldest of nine, was a college student when I was born and was now well into his career as a civil engineer and a captain in the Army Corps of Engineers. I was the oldest child of two eldest children who were raised to not complain, to not expect much, and to not feel entitled to anything you did not personally work your ass off for. The new one-speaker A-Track radio was a physical manifestation of how hard my parents worked to give me something they thought that I wanted. Though it wasn't quite right, it was an offering, and I knew even then that I could not complain or ask for a different thing than what I'd been given. It was better to be grateful than to get exactly what you wanted. My gratitude was genuine, and it plummeted down as deep as my disappointment. And that depth 
I felt a soft bruise of sorrow for something I could not name. I heard the arrows of my parents' attempts at love whiz past my head, the shots never quite sticking the mark of my heart, but the effort, efforts were palpable nonetheless. None of us knew what we were doing, but we were all giving our, our best. My chest swelled with an amplitude of chagrin and my own disappointment, and in the gap between gratitude and shame flourished the wow and flutter of feeling unseen. It was 1981, and I was a tall, awkward pork chop of a girl in boys' clothes with a thicket of dark hair that hugged my round face like an overpadded helmet. I wore ratty cutoffs that my mother threatened to destroy if I ever took them off, white tube socks with three stripes, red, blue, red, that clamped the top curves of my calves in a worn, thin, Kelly Green t-shirt that just hugged the tender protrusions that had begun to emerge on my chest, much to my utter unspeakable dismay. I also wore a red and white Peterbilt trucker hat backwards on my head, smashed down over my, over the mass of my burnt umber hair, causing the ends of my would-be Dorothy Hamill to bozo out at the sides. The hat was a gift from my long-haul driving grandpa, who came back from runs, trekking runs to the southern United States with forbidden delights, like illegal fireworks. My younger brother Chris and I, uh, my, <clears throat> sorry, my younger brother Chris and I rested the hat back and forth from each other over the years, and during the summer of age 12, the Peterbilt hat was a red, proud crown I sported on the very precipice of discovering that the way I felt most comfortable in my clothes and in my body was about to be a massive source of concern, heckling, intervention, embarrassment, and shame. I had no idea what was soon to come. So I'll stop there. <laughs> so I put on headphones just because John was telling, uh, telling us in the chat that he had some echo. So let us know if there's folks in the chat, if we're still getting echo and if you can still get the audio. Um, that was, that was my favorite part. And I had asked uh, Cooper to read that because I think the, the, the piece to, about like your family trying so hard to give you what you want uh, materially and, and then it just slightly missing the mark um, is, is like it's something so relatable i think in every family but i think there was another sort of layer um for me as a as a fellow you know trans person who you know my family kept trying to figure it out like why why i wasn't quite fitting in why i wasn't quite happy you know like and i i thought there was sort of the subtlety the boom box comes to stand in for so much more uh in your family right and throughout your book um it's it seems that you know, they're, your family is really grounded in love, even as there are all these other things happening, right? There's there's violence and there's hard shit happening, but you keep coming back um, and you keep trying to sort of re-engage with your family. At least that's the sense. That's not always explicitly said, but that's the sense. And so I think one of the questions that folks had um, down at the bottom, but also that I have was just sort of, as you're thinking about writing um, autobiographical pieces, how do you think about the, the, the truths that you tell about your family and how much how much you want to engage with with those pieces that are far in the past and then also that are more recent. Yeah, it, it's tough when you write creative nonfiction, you write about yourself. Uh, unfortunately, you don't live in a bubble completely alone, right? And, uh, and our lives are shaped by other people. And um, there's a lot to consider, you know, ethically and um, artistically about how we engage with other folks and how we, uh, how we're responsible to other people and when we write. And um, I think for a lot of people having a nonfiction writer in the family is probably a small nightmare if they're, <laughs> if they're writing memoir or uh, personal essays. Um, you know, and I think too, I grew up in a, in a culture where, um, you know, it was so taboo to talk about your business, right? Like, you know, uh, and I think there's uh, a sense of me wanting to kind of push back against that silence that shaped me, but also, on the other hand, sort of um, embrace the fact that my family is also a bunch of storytellers, and um, I grew up with people who tell tons of stories, there's tons of history, I grew up with four generations of my family as my neighbors, and, and um, you know, there's such a great storytelling and there's so much lore and and jokes and humor and all that so um so all those things kind of shape me and um yeah and it's and i think i just try to um 
consider the point of the point of me writing this stuff is to to use myself to kind of get at something, and so the point of it isn't to eviscerate somebody else or embarrass somebody else or um, tell tales that belong to somebody else, you know. Um, but I can't tell my story as as somebody like living in a vacuum. So th there's a lot to consider, and uh, you know, it's um, and I think it's tricky too because when somebody writes a story. There's, um, you know, other folks who are like, wait, that's not how I remember it going down. That's not what, it, that's not how I felt about it. That's not what, that's not what we thought happened. And, you know, there's the way in which, you know, writing about it kind of positions you as, as sort of the uh, quote unquote author authority about it, you know, and, and, um, and I think that's something to be considerate of and, and careful about too, you know. Yeah. Well, I think um, what really comes through throughout your writing, but especially in these pieces with your family is your humility, you know, your, your sort of generosity and your willingness to reach towards your family at every turn and be like, I inherited, you know, some hard things, but I also inherited, you know, these, these other good things, you know, and mm -hmm. that open heartedness of seeing where somebody's trying, even if they're not, even if they're not making the mark, uh, I think is, mm -hmm. um, it's something that flows through, the book and it's something that I have been impressed with it with you as an individual and then as in your writing it's like even when you are mad or sad or you know frustrated throughout you know these moments of sort of trials and tribulations in the book in the writing on the page you're grappling with how do I how do I figure out where the other person is coming from but also how do I extend the most compassion to my wounded heart <laughs> that I can, you know, and I think modeling that on the page is really um, exciting to see because I don't think that feels like a possibility model for me that I don't think we get to see that often. Um, and, and particularly uh, within masculinity, right? Um, and so one of the things that I was thinking a lot about is sort of the, and I think in part, you know, like the, you, you're, you have a sort of traditional Catholic upbringing and then you gravitate towards Buddhism later in life. Um, or in your adult life. And one of the things that I was thinking a lot about in this book is about the gift of aging, um, that you live through a very cool time, uh, a very like awesome time in the early 90s that a lot of people are nostalgic for and a lot of young people. And in fact, there are pieces in this book that talk about that, right? People who did not live through that time long for that time, right? And I think that's, um, that's something I observe too. Uh, with younger people, like they wish that they were around in the '90s, right? Um, but you you give that time its due, while also being really clearly psyched to be an adult and getting older and having getting to live, you know. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of gifts of aging and how you um, how you think about that, like getting to grow into a middle aged adult man <laughs> and and what what that's taught you um and how that's you know maybe different than what you what you expected yeah well i think for so long i i just never envisioned making it through my 20s i never when i was younger i never even i could never even conceive of myself being 30 years old you know and then um i transitioned started transitioning medically in my my early 30s um which even then feel it feels like i felt like a latecomer you know in some ways and um, you know, and I think for a long time, it was just kind of like, how do I get through this year? How do I get through this month? How do I get through this week? And kind of figuring out a way to sort of move beyond uh, the immediacy of, of being in survival mode, whether I was actually still physically in survival, <laughs> needing to be in survival mode, or if that was my parasympathetic nervous system being like, you know, 911 all the time and yeah. uh you know and so in that space in the in, you know in the reality or the 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 mental um state of that you know it's really hard to plan <laughs> it's really hard to work towards a future if you can't see yourself there and so um you know a lot of this book was just about kind of the process of deciding i was going to stick around you know and um that i was like committing to to being here and um, you know, I think when the when the um, pre-order stuff first went up on the daughter website for the for the book, um, there was language kind of describing me as a trans elder, <laughs> and I had a bunch of friends like my age, peers like my age or slightly older, who were just like, "What <laughs> trans elder?" And you know, and um, 
you know, and I was like, uh, yeah, it feels shocking to me too. And, and, you know, the, the thing is like to, to be a trans elder, it's kind of like, all you have to do is live. And that's a huge privilege that, that I've had, you know, that I've, I'm still here and I've been able to hang on and, um, and I don't take it lightly, you know? Um, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's a trip to be older because, uh, I, you know, and I think just kind of coming up in queer, queer culture too, it's so, um, it's so youth centric, um, at the same time it's starved for elders. And, uh, you know, and the tricky thing about being positioned as an elder is that it positions somebody as having the answers or not being completely flawed or all these things that I don't want to take on because <laughs> I don't have all the answers and I'm deeply flawed. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to be like, you know, I have the answers for anybody because I don't. Um, so yeah, it, it's kind of a trip, you know, like I think for me, it's like this sort of sense of getting to a certain place. And then the weirdest thing that I'm dealing with is just being an older person, you know? Um, and I think the questions that come up for me around gender identity lately are, are things I never really expected, like, um, what it means to be a man in the world and kind of not have a real job, <laughs> you know? I mean, I work all the freaking time. Like I, I have like, really, I have like seven jobs, you know what I mean? I'm an artist. So I'm always working on, you know, a bunch of different projects, but I don't have like, uh, you know, like a career that I go to with a 401k or something and how that is very gendered, you know, like how, um, and I recently had a conversation with some cis men um, who, you know, some friends who were lovely, but there was this sort of sense of like, like I was vibing on distress that like, I didn't have like a day job. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a gender thing. Like another gender thing to discover. Like, you know, if you don't have a career or day job, you're somehow like not doing the man thing right. And um, so, so that kind of stuff is interesting, right? These different layers that I think, um, that I, I've kind of picked up on that stuff. One of the things that I really appreciate about um, one of the essays that you wrote, and I forget where it was originally published, so I'm sorry, I meant to look it up, but the piece about you um, coming to live in your body and you know doing pull-ups and chin-ups and feeling, feeling an ownership of your body um, that you'd never experienced before and sort of being a late blooming athlete. Um, and mm -hmm. I think I, I have also experienced that and feeling like, what it means to be healthier in your thirties and forties and fifties than you were as a teenager, because you actually are embodied for the first time. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, also thinking about what, um, what, you know, again, how, how that sort of relates to Buddhism and like the idea of what, it, what embodiment means. And when you, when you are able to actually be more than just a floating head. Right. Because I think, um, this idea of, of like, well, I'm going to separate my consciousness from, you know, from my, from myself and, you know, so try and look at myself from the outside in, but also really then try and reintegrate. And so I, I think to me, one of the gifts of transness is having the experience of sort of disintegration and reintegration, um, that I think many people don't experience unless they're forced to. And so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about in a more metaphorical way, sort of how writing, how Buddhism, how transition has kind of worked together for you around integration and disintegration. Yeah, thank you for that beautiful read on that. Um, I think that a lot of it, it for me, um, you know, the, being able to inhabit my body in this way of like feeling um, like I want to be here, like this is something I'm going to do. Um, that floating head thing you describe is <laughs> very much how I spent a lot of my life. And um, that sense of integration and, and wanting to do stuff that I felt like was um, because I was so dissociated, um, I was unavailable um, to me. Um, you know, I think for me, it was a sense of um, feeling more like other people, like instead of being like, oh, I'm doing this thing, which kind of leading up to um, the process of transition was like, oh, this makes me this outside, this outsider, this, this unlovable thing. I'm, you know, terrified, but then kind of having to 
live in my skin i was like oh actually this just makes me like every other fucking person who has to like live in a body and get through it you know and so i feel like that actually um made me feel more connected to other people like okay we're doing this like this is we're here yeah um, i don't know if that answers your question or not yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is that is one hundred percent my experience too. Is like, oh, here are this is this is how I am connected to other people in the great scheme, right? Like, this is actually what other people feel, um, and I I appreciate. I think that is often lost in the nuance of trans conversation. Is like, no, this doesn't make you less a part of humanity. This doesn't make you a weirdo. This actually allows you to be part of the fabric in a different kind of way, um, and I really. I think, you know, that's, you don't necessarily explicitly say that at any point, but that's constantly the feeling is this, this feeling of finding your way back in both to your, to your own heart, but also to like your community, because I think you're it, through your art, like all of your art is about community in one way or another. I mean, you're making art with other people. Sister Spit was so much about community, um, both like, my sense is anyway, like within the van and then also like in every, you know, every little like podunk place you stopped and every, you know, like, and the, and the sister spit tour um, stops that I was lucky enough to get to see as a teenager. Like that was so much about building this network across the country um, and feeling like, you know, there's, there we're out there, right? Like we're, you know, even, and, and in a lot of ways in a relatively pre-internet, I mean, obviously the internet existed, but it, yeah. you know, in a mostly pre-internet way. Yeah. Um, and so I just have been thinking about how your art plays such a role, all that it, you're, you're, I mean, for, I think a lot of folks here know you and know you relatively well, but for folks who don't know you, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about all the different kinds of art you do, cause you, you do a lot. <laughs> Yeah, you know, mostly I focus on writing these days, um, but I, my first love is visual art. And so uh, I grew up drawing and painting and um, I went to art school right out of right out of high school and went to Mass College of Art, which is a state school. So I worked like 40 hours a week and got my degree and left with no student loans because it was like kind of affordable thing to do. And um, yeah, and I... I think that, uh, you know, it was really kind of my main focus in a lot of ways. Um, and I kind of hit a point around 2001 or so, kind of like post September 11th, where I sort of hit a wall with my visual art and felt like I um, wasn't sure how to say what I wanted to say with it. And so um, I didn't completely stop making art then, but, um, and I haven't stopped completely, but it, it's not what I'm focused on the most right now. Um, and I, yeah, I, I'm kind of, you know, I think it's like ADD sort of thing. And I'm just a, a curious person and I'm a tactile person and I like to work with my hands. And so I'm always uh, always trying to get my hands into something. I, I've been, um, you know, I'm always cooking, baking, making kimchi, fermenting stuff, like uh, making like beard balm from plants I pick when I'm out on walks with the dogs. Like I, I just, I like doing stuff. I grew up with, you know, my both my parents, cooked and my father uh you know he built our house he fixed our cars he gardened um he made art you know and so i just i think i kind of grew up with that sort of sense of like um knowing how to do stuff and um and you know being sort of a generalist and able to do a lot of things um you know and i've worked in film and um uh, um, I see Bill Basquin on the call. I know Bill's, he's at work. Uh, I was lucky to be in, in one of Bill's films, which was um, an amazing experience. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do where I'm, you know, making visual art or writing is, is very solitary. So experiences where I've got to like be in a band with somebody or work on somebody's film or be in someone's film. Uh, so great, you know, to, to have that collaborative experience. There's a lot of love. Go I'm getting distracted by the comments because there's so much cute love going on over here. <laughs> I know. It's awesome. It's like old home week. I love it. Um, so I know that actually brings me to uh, the a question uh, more generally about community. And then I'm going to have you read um, another piece, maybe specifically about like queer, queer community. Um, if you want to think about what you want to read next, but I, you know, I think a lot of the, the sort of early, um, dissonance around um, how trans people would fit into 
queer and specifically dyke community, you you capture really well, and you capture um, a lot of the fears that trans men in particular I know uh, had about like what it would mean to transition, um, like and to leave. You you created such a beautiful, amazing, vibrant feminist dyke community, even though you were not ever particularly like you're like that that was like a shirt that was beloved but didn't quite fit right and like i kept it in my closet but it wasn't it wasn't the right the right fit for me and um i very much resonate with that growing up in queer and feminist community and being that's my home that's my political home that's my emotional home that will always be my home and yet if the shirt doesn't fit the shirt doesn't fit right and um and I think you know some several of the pieces in this book are really beautiful articulations about the pain of like knowing that you are in the right place and in the right home, but that somehow some piece of your estrangement from a label uh, or a or a piece of an identity that other people put on you is going to cause um, cause potentially ostracization or um, loss. And how do you hold on to the good pieces of your community um or how do you find a home a new home within your community as you do what's right for you um and so i wonder if you could talk a little bit about that or perhaps uh choose a piece to read that kind of reflects on that because i think it's such an important piece in the book and it's going to be helpful for a lot of people who are i think so many trans folks um of all genders really fear like i'm going to lose my my created home yeah. if i do what's right for me yeah and that was definitely a huge fear of mine and then i kind of left san francisco for what was supposed to be a summer in santa fe and ended up being there for eight years and and i think while i was gone like everybody in san francisco transitioned so i was like what was the <laughs> what was i worried about um you know but, it, but like you said i love what you said about it being your your political home and it, you know like culture it's a cultural home right like coming up in a dyke community for me is very much like my cultural home and um and that informs my gender right like butch identity is still really important to me i don't necessarily identify as butch but butch identity is a huge part of my history and who i am um you know and i feel like being part of queer community um you know the masculinity modeled um you know whether it was like you know bears at the the eagle bar or you know or you know the older butches and community um you know that was a huge uh model for an alternative masculinity than like sort of a toxic you know kind of cis masculinity um out there in the broader world right and um and that's super important to me um yeah and i think you know now kind of looking back at those fears a lot of what has changed is just going back again to being older right like in my early 20s i moved to san francisco uh, Zoe Lewis in Provincetown was like, when you get to San Francisco, go to the Bearded Lady Cafe and find my friends Harry and Silas and tell them I sent you. And I showed up there the day after I got to San Francisco and like basically parked myself at a table with my journal and by osmosis had a community, right? But I was like in my early 20s. Like nobody has that fucking time, you know? <laughs> like, um, you know, and that that sort of space of like this, this is your space and you go and you're recognized there. Like that is, I feel like something very particular to um, to a certain age and uh, a certain place. You know, those kinds of spaces I think don't exist in the same way anymore because people can find each other online, right? And so um, I think what you were talking about too with um, you know Sister Spit tour it was early days internet. Like I think Topiary maybe had a laptop on the tour that was like, it didn't, it was like a fancy typewriter and it was, you know, this big clunky thing. Um, you know, I think that she was doing something that we would now call blogging, um, you know, but most of us were, you know, lining up at a payphone with our calling cards to like call somebody. We had a binder with um, addresses of our contacts. We would show up in a town using a road atlas and they, you know, total strangers would have 12 of us sleeping on their floor. And um, and I love that kind of analog thing where I can, I'm like, how did we even do that? Like, I can't even imagine how we made it work and uh, how we didn't get lost more often. Um, but that idea that like, you would invite 12 queer strangers to sleep on your floor and then put on a show for them. I mean, it was so, it was so awesome, you know, cause so all of us were, 
I don't think anybody who I was touring with grew up in San Francisco. We were all people who who found ourselves in the mission in San Francisco in the early 90s and, and were kind of escaping where we grew up, you know? Um, so to go back to to other places around the country and to, to have that kind of like welcome was, was huge. So, um, you know, so I think there's a couple different things. There's one is like those kinds of spaces don't exist as much anymore. Um, and then I think like when I do go to those kinds of spaces, it's like, you know, like I show up like this and it's like, well, who, who's this bear or who's this guy, you know, but it's like, you know, like I don't necessarily have that sort of like visual recognition of like, you know, dyke history or butch history. And, um, you know, so there's that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, um, maybe I'll just read a piece. I'll, I'll read some. So I'm going to just ramble on, I guess. Um, I think I'm going to read a little bit from the love that remains, which, um, which you spoke about a little bit. <clears throat> so the love that remains starts off with a quote. I used to dream of the past, but like they say, yesterday never comes. Sometimes there's a song in my brain and I feel that my heart knows the refrain. I guess it's just the music that brings on nostalgia for an age yet to come. And that's the buzzcocks from their song, Nostalgia. I listened to my friend Brooke talk about her obsession with the dyke culture of 90 San Francisco, a scene I was part of and she was not. She wonders aloud if there is a word that describes the sense of nostalgia for a time in which you did not live. I say that I imagine this hypothetical word would have, would have to be German with no direct English equivalent. I long to let her soak in the warm pool of memories that flood my hippocampus. That time was my queer coming of age, comparable perhaps to high school or college days for more well-adjusted normative folks. I smile and paste the layers of time together. Imagine Brooke delirious and sweaty on the dance floor and muff dive, making out with other dykes in the dank graffiti brindled men's room where the girls back their asses up to the urinal to piss. In our messy packs, weren't there always trans women back then, bellied up to the bar, hooking elbows with us in the pit at shows as we skanked in the chaos? Gender was a wet paper bag we were all busy punching our way out of so we could choose what we jumped back into. In this mad fold-in of my chronology, the past and present pressed towards each other to make a seamless picture. But on some days, the misty, glowing corona, a word that I'll never write again after all this, the mis misty, <laughs> glowing corona of memory fades in, in the harsh light of last call. I can't see the me nor Brooke of now, neither of us, in that picture. I find, I find one German word. I'm probably going to butcher it. It's close, but not quite right. Zenshot a German noun that denotes an intense longing or pining, a deep emotional state. Sometimes it's used to describe life's longings. Perhaps it encompasses something of our unfinished business, the repairs we never managed to make, the canvases leaning unfinished against a cinder block wall. My friend Brooke is a lesbian trans woman. She's 10 years younger than me and even younger in trans years. I love hanging out with her because she's smart and funny and alive. She's a smoke jumper who can parachute into the fire of any social situation, and she will meet it with the sheer power of her extroversion. She's game for just about anything. Despite the shitty stuff she's experienced in life, her compass always swivels to a magnetic north of positivity, and in that way, we are alike. We both relish the feast of tonight like survivors because we might be dead tomorrow because we both know we might be. We both know that life is fleeting and ephemeral and filled with impossible brutality and loss, but also the most gorgeous messy joys and phosphorescent blazes of connection. So why not gather as many of those fragile branches of light to your breast as you can and try to build a nest? How can we make it so that you can see the body of all your myths in the sky? Brooke has a stamina and enthusiasm for dating that is entertaining to listen to and leaves me a little breathless. Is this what I sounded like in the zenith of my dating prowess, I wonder? She often wants to talk about her lesbian identity, like she's really fucking excited about it. I don't think I've ever had such long conversations about being a dyke before, even when that's what I perce was perceived to be, even when that's what, even when that was the default identity that felt better than anything else I could possibly conceive of for myself. Butch was an apartment that I could fit most of myself into and live happily for a little while. But she is so happy to be a lesbian. I think if the politics around Mishfest hadn't been so fucked up, she would have been over the moon there. That shit was made for a woman like Brooke. She belongs. 
I'll stop there. I love that. And, um, you know, that's something that comes up a lot around like the, the trans lesbians that are in the community at Karis. It's like, you like you are made for this. <laughs> like, you know, I love, um, I loved hearing about Brooke, uh, because I, you know, pieces of Brooke's character, uh, who I know she must be a real person, but remind me of my friends who I'm like, you fought hard to be in our community. And like, I'm so glad, you know, and I think when I hear, uh, transphobia directed towards trans women and particularly towards trans lesbians. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, th th like these, these women have fought so hard to be our sisters in this community. Like, you know, this is, this is so clearly their home, you know? Um, and I think I'm always flummoxed when, when, uh, people are like, well, trans men are fine, you know, and still belong in lesbian community, but trans women don't. And I'm just like, right. So, so heartbroken at that. Um, and I think, you know, the, you know, the, that piece is not an inherently political piece, but I think you, you get to the underpinnings of why, um, why that, that logic is so flawed, uh, when people are transphobic in that way, you know, it's so, it's so painful, um, to see trans women be excluded from lesbian community. Um, and I was thinking a lot about what you said just before you read that piece about, you know, what it means to be illegible to people. Um, so to, to, to other queers. So there's another piece uh, where you get uh, mistaken by two younger dykes as the bouncer outside of a club. <laughs> they try and give you your ID, their IDs, um, which has also happened to me outside of a lesbian bar. So uh, I, you know, it's great. And also it's like, I think the, the longing, um, the sort of reverse of the longing that you're talking about is the longing to be to be known by people who are your people right to walk down the street and you know you and your wife are read as a cisgender straight couple i presume and and that could be this kind of dislocation too right it's like both you know yeah. yeah it's like it's like that's not who either of you are and yet that's what the world sees and so i think it's the contradiction for many trans people is like yeah i am more authentically myself and I am more at home and yet I've become more eligible to a community that I used to just be able to like look across the room and nod at. Right. And like, be like, yo, what's up, you know, be the queer nod <laughs> and, and feel safe. And so I, I wonder, and that tension's hard to talk about, especially with people who are earlier in their transition or who don't feel who are still very legibly queer or who feel that they will never quote unquote pass or who feel that they will never be have access to uh, trans technologies that will make them feel at home in their bodies. And because it is a privilege to feel like, okay, well, my body is in alignment, right? Like I have essentially gotten what I needed to be whole. But the trade-off of that is this, this longing for what is, what is lost in, in legibility. And so I wonder if you could talk, I, I, I felt that you really balanced those things um, in such a generous way, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Oh, wow. Yeah, I don't even know where to start, honestly. Um, I, I think you said everything so perfectly, <laughs> so beautifully. It, it, it is really, you know, for me, this sort of sense of, you know, trading one kind of invisibility for another or, you know, in the manhood is boring piece and talking about sort of the the blissful privilege of just moving through the world unscathed, you know, and like what what a trip that is to just like, not have anybody make comments about my masculinity or not leave a public restroom with security waiting to haul me out because somebody complained about me being in there. And, um, and like, just, you know, the, the privilege of just anonymity in a way. Right. Um, but that the, the flip side of that is, is this invisibility or uh, the illegibility that you speak of. And, um, and there is grief for that. I think captain was saying, yeah, there's the grief right there. And I agree. Yeah. I think one of the things that, um, yeah, the, as a butch or as someone who's read as butch, like having um, the, the, the constant, I felt the constant threat of violence all the time, right? And being in hypervigilance and people always watching me, always being aware of what I was doing. And to have that go away is you don't, you don't even totally understand that weight until it disappears. And then you're like, oh, this is what, is this what other people feel? Who knows? Um, but I think that's also, you also talked about what it means to be particularly a white man and to have 
um, you know, to not be surveilled, you know, like as white men, we are not, we, we are, we get that kind of illegit of invisibility. Right. And that sort of, right. we're, yeah. we're the, we're the default neutral. Um, and, 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 you know, so what it means to sort of to disappear totally while other people become more, more hyper surveilled, more visible, um, yeah. and sort of then part of what manhood becomes is, how do you how do you interrupt that right like how do you how do you then like sort of be the stealth bomber that um the stealth bomber for peace or justice right like that that, that does um that does a disruptive thing that doesn't allow um the the sort of mechanisms of of white supremacy or you know you know misogyny or whatever else to kind of go unchecked if we are allowed in those rooms how do we then flip the tables over right yeah, yeah, and you're right. It's a it's a completely different uh, layer, you know, whiteness of of, of the the visibility, um, you know, eligibility piece, right? Um, and and yeah, I do feel that there that it bestows a responsibility towards addressing those issues when they come up, and they do, and they can be really subtle and. You know, and what's been kind of interesting is asking other men, cis men, in scenarios where. Um, you know, I'm agonizing, like, well, how do I tell this, this guy in, in this like social situation who keeps making these stupid fucked up sexist comments, like, how do I approach it, you know, and just asking other men and, and, and this one guy, you know, a friend was just saying, just, just tell him, like, you don't need to coddle him. Don't take care of his feelings. Just tell him what he's saying is bullshit, you know, and just being like, oh, okay. Like, it, it's not just me who, it's not my job alone to deal with it and and um and kind of learning about like how to interrupt those conversations from different perspectives you know um it, it's 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 ongoing and um and i do think of it as a as a responsibility for sure and trying to um you know kind of use the the sort of position of, of white male privilege to to kick a door open you know what i mean like how can we like kick the door open and then take it off its hinges because it's it's fucking done it's tired <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? we need a renovation <laughs> yeah i mean i think um you know even and that sort of leads me into i really want to foreground your writing for the rest of our conversation and then get into questions because this book really ultimately is a memoir of writing um and thinking about kind of how we um how we learn to write ourselves um and how we learn what narratives are acceptable what narratives are celebrated what narratives are useful to us and then to other people i wonder if you can just kind of talk i think a lot of people are interested in 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 your writing journey and how you how you came to write this book um you know these pieces have been published many of them in a lot of different places mm -hmm. uh you started as a poet, as a spoken word writer, doing one kind of writing, you've really written kind of all over the map. So can you talk about your evolution as a writer and then also sort of some of the, the, the sort of ways that that intersects with what it means to be a trans writer in this moment? Yeah. Um, yeah, like we met at, uh, at Lambda in a fiction cohort, right? And I, I see Lawler on the call or Lawler was on the call, um, was in that group too. So um, I, I think, you know, early on, I was thinking that uh, fiction was the way to go. And I mean, I, I still am writing short stories here and there and I have a novel idea. Um, but I think what I was trying to do in that, that particular cohort was stuff that needed to be memoir. And um, yeah, and so when I first started doing, I first started writing and conceiving it of it as as actual writing. Um, I was writing reams of verbal poetry um, through high school and in my first couple of years of you know, like college age or whatever. I was writing epic amounts of poetry. I wish I was as prolific. Um, um, <laughs> Lawler's like, write your novel, man. No press. <laughs> um, you know, and. Uh, I think my first time actually uh, writing and, and considering it like a, a, a finished thing, Harry Dodge asked me to be in a show at the Bearded Lady. So again, early 90s, it was like, hey, show your art. 
be in my band, <laughs> you know, come, come work on my film. Uh, and Harry was like, oh, you're really funny. Come, come be in the show I'm putting on Friday night at the cafe. And uh, I ended up like writing uh, a piece the, the night before that was about my, my lover who died of AIDS and made everybody in the place like totally break down and cry. And then it was like, that's it. No one's ever going to invite me to do spoken word again because I was, you know, I was billed as funny. Like you're supposed to be funny. Um, you know, and, and so it was very much through that community of uh, where people were making space for different voices to be heard, you know, and uh, Cindy and Michelle started Sister Spit to kind of push back against the, the spoken word scene, the slam scene in San Francisco was really dude bro centric. Um, I mean, there were lots of really, really great people and, um, in those circles, of course, Bucky Sinister, I think of as like just a, a golden light who uh, is a man I've I love I've loved Bucky Sinister from the minute I met him. He was like, you know, this long haired hillbilly guy at Muddy Waters Cafe, and I was like, just love that guy. Uh, There's a lot of really super great people in that scene, but the overall vibe was like when a when like a queer person got up to to read, especially a, a woman, a queer woman, a dyke, a butch, whatever. Like it was like bottles being thrown, right? So. Um, so that idea to kind of create a space where people could, uh, you know, have a spot to say their story. I feel, I feel like it was very nineties, very urgent. Like these stories are being told. And I think everything I was writing then too felt like, um, a shotgun blast of urgency and trauma <laughs> and emotion. And just like, I'm going to say it all now, or I won't ever get another chance. And, um, that sort of form of writing, I feel like was developmentally very important for me. Um, but it was, it's like kind of horrifying to look at it now and um, thinking about how unprocessed so much of that stuff was for me personally. And then to kind of like, you know, basically like, you know, pepper spray an audience with it. I'm like, Oh my God. I'm just, I mean, it was like pre trigger warning times. It was pre everything living on YouTube forever times, but <laughs> Rebecca, trauma vomit. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And so that idea of like, you know, using the the craft of writing to process through something, to to actually filter through it and to think it through and to and to look at it in different ways, you know, I think was a, a big part of my development as a writer. And I also was like very much self-taught. So um, I ended up going to grad school for writing in 2010. Um, and I was like, oh my God, I have no idea what's going on here. I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never read any of the books people are talking about. I I, I don't have a mind for theory. I've never read any Judy Butler. Like, um, it was all very, it's like, I felt like the last kid at the party, you know, and it's like, oh my God, this has been going on for a long time. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm kind of meandering now. I don't even remember the question, but the, <laughs> so about your trajectory as a writer yeah, yeah. Uh, and then kind of, so how you got to, how, how you ended up getting to the place where this is the book yeah. that we have now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but basically this book came about because I was cheating on a different book I was working on. Um, I was about 325 pages into a memoir and I was trying to really finish it up a couple summers ago. And um, I just felt pretty despondent when I was working on it. It was a lot to kind of get through. Sweet home, yeah, you know, like it, it could be, you know, these moments when you're, um, it's just, yeah, it was just a lot. And I felt like this is the first book I have to write and I'm not gonna be a real writer until I write this book. And um, I think Melissa's on the call. I remember reading Melissa's beautiful book, um, Abandon Me and, you know, how it, memoir and essays and how she's able to kind of look at, um, some overlapping subjects from different time periods, different voices, you know, different perspectives. Um, you know, and I thought about, well, you know, I could put together a collection of essays, but you know, what I sent daughter, I sent Jennifer, I don't know if she's still on the call, but like, um, you know, what I said, Jennifer originally had short stories and poems and it was just like a mess. It had everything in it. And, um, and they helped to kind of give it a lot of shape. And, uh, yeah, Abandon Me is such a great book. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, Melissa. Um, yeah, so I took a break from that memoir, which I've been back working on 
these last few weeks, um, which has been great. It's been, you know, it's mostly about like early days of the AIDS crisis and kind of being in this weird pandemic, whatever this is we're in right now. Um, it's been really useful to kind of go back to that topic, go back to that subject. And I was an epic journaler back then. So a lot of what I'm referencing are, are old journals and letters and stuff. And like kind of thinking about like, how did I get, how did I survive? How did I get through this time? And how did I make sense of my world as it was changing and people all around me were dying and what it meant to, um, <laughs> what it meant to, to come of age and, and come into sexuality um, with the threat of, of AIDS is like a death sentence, you know? Um, so I still think I'm not answering your question, but, um, <laughs> I, I think it's great. No, no, no. You got there. Uh, and I do, I love these days guys. So <laughs> <laughs> I love, um, that I, uh, that Melissa's book is, you know, one of your models because I actually, I do really see that. And I see, you know, it's great to have contemporaries to inform our work, you know, and like being able to, to really think about your, your not so distant history. Right. I mean, this, um, this book, you know, does start in childhood and I, you know, I made Cooper read Boombox cause I just love that essay, but a lot of this is very recent history or, you know, in the last, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years. It's not, it's not all like, you know, early childhood. And so I think um, thinking about one of the things that I was thinking a lot about as I read it was particularly for trans people, uh, we've had this exponential shift in our culture from the early nineties to now. Right. And, right. and, you know, I, you write about the real life test, which is the idea that like you have to live uh, what we would call now a social transition for several years before you are trans enough to be able to access medical technologies. Um, and that was my model too. And I remember, you know, not, not thinking that um, I was trans because I didn't want to leave, cut off everyone I knew and move across the country and never talk to them again and basically live an entirely stealth life, which was, was what I thought you had to do until I was like 20 years old. Right. Um, and I was like, well, you know, that's not, that's, I must not hate my life that much. Right. I mean, that was the only thing I had ever seen. Um, and so when I think about that was, that was the model 20 years ago in my, in Atlanta for me, um, you know, and, and where we are now, where you, t you talk about some of the more contemporary technologies that people have access to now, which are, you know, YouTube and videos like this and so many books. We were talking about Lauren Cameron's book, Body Alchemy, yeah. which was such a, a pivotal book for so many of us, like this book that, you know, I think lots of people went and read, um, but also, you know, the drag King book we were talking about and, you know, lots of other books, you know, stone Butch blues of course was the, the, the seminal book for many of us. Um, and, you know, I think as a bookseller and as a book person, um, you know, finding our stories was, was the way that we found each other. Um, and so now the internet is the way that so many people, find each other. And I'm wondering if you think, um, if you think anything is lost in translation now, if you think, I mean, I often think like, eh, it's a net good, right? Like it's, it's better that there are more stories out there. Um, but sometimes like an old curmudgeonly part of me is like, but you know, having to work to find the stories is, makes them more treasured. I don't know, but maybe that's just like a, um, a way of recuperating the pain of my past. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder, you know, in thinking about it, a lot of this book is about how um, how you how you write a trans story, how one writes a trans story, and what counts as a trans story, right? Yeah. And so, whether that's on a YouTube video, writing a you know writing your own narrative on a YouTube video, or writing a a, a book, um, I wonder if you if you how you see it um, as different now. Well, I think the cool thing is, is that there's, you know, the, the, the gatekeeping isn't there anymore, right? Like anyone can find anybody, anyone can say, I'm going to share my story and my journey. Um, I think that's awesome, right? Like the means of production are, you know, much more in, in control and in, in the hands of the creator, right? Um, um, but there is something I really, you know, we were talking about yesterday about the Drag King book and Lauren Cameron's book of, of how... Um, 
how meaningful it was to have images, right? And you would find these books of images of queer people. And it was like this sacred thing where, you know, for me anyway, it was like, I just wanted to kind of sit in a chair and just like pour over these human beings, you know, <laughs> these beautiful photographs. And um, in Lauren's book, I remember just, um, it was before I um, was coming out as trans, very, very on the cusp and, um, like social transition, I guess you would call it, but uh, but just how um, overwhelming it was to see the, those images. Cause it was like, I mean, there were a couple people in the book who were people in my community who are around, but like you said, that sense of, um, you know, late eighties, early nineties, um, trans people having to do the real life test and then wandering off and being stealth. And that was a lot of that fear of losing community is like, this is what I have to do. Like, where is the place for me here? Because there were a lot of trans men within the queer community who then didn't feel like there was a place for them. And they kind of disappeared into the night, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the uh, sharing trans piece in the book, even though I wrote it in 2013, so it's like seven years ago, feels like another world because so much has changed since then, right? Like everything is just like, it's already old history. Um, and, I, and I think that's like for those of us who are a little bit older or who uh, transitioned a little bit longer ago. I mean, for me, I'm like, oh, I'm not really trans elder compared to a lot of people I, I've known in my life for sure who transitioned way before me. Um, but the the rapid changes and and conversations and visibility um, is, is trippy, you know. And visibility isn't really um, all it's cracked up to be, right? I mean, I think there's, you know, in a way we can be like, oh yeah, there's visibility, so we're cool. But then there's you know the commensurate increase in rights and justice and safety for mostly trans women of color, trans people of color, um, queer people of color is is not there, right? So um so the visibility i think is kind of a you know double-edged sword and uh um you know can kind of lull us into thinking like we have some acceptance or something when it does, it's not really quite as equal as it, as it should be um yeah um yeah i wonder if you could read a little bit from the last piece in the book um because i think that's that's a really lovely throwing a sheet over the ghost um that's a really lovely it sort of gets at the, the trans writer question mm -hmm. um how much of it do you think i should read i don't know what no, what kind of time we have um i would read like a couple pages and then we'll uh take some questions so um okay uh this is called throwing a sheet over the ghost a writer is a person for whom language is a problem said roland bart a trans person is also someone for whom language is a problem. And if you were a trans writer, language is a problem not doubled, but squared. Trans live, lives rendered into literature bump up against the limits of narrative, whether imposed from within or interpolated from without. Trans literature has exploded in the past two decades. Earlier trans memoir was so important because it sought to prove we exist. It sought to chip out a form of our humanity and make us something knowable. Early trans memoir threw a sheet over the goat so it could be seen. It made our corporeal forms legible. But now that the world knows we exist, our literature faces other challenges. Tenzin Norgay and Peter Hillary were the first known humans to summit Everest, and they were subsequent expeditions of both grandeur and disaster, harrowing tales of pushing humans' possible limits. But today, now that just about anyone with enough disposable income and reasonable physical health can make that climb, the tale of ascent is less interesting in and of itself because the uniqueness of the rendered experience is diluted. I don't mean to say that on a personal scale, such an adventure wouldn't be thrilling if not life-changing. In a similar way, now that we know trans people exist, it's not enough for us to write to prove that we do. But even with the multivalence of our lives, it's difficult not to capitulate to the external pressures of narrative and form as a trans writer. If you've been a trans writer in an MFA workshop, for example, you know how your man, you know how your mere transness on the page is enough to dogleg a workshop into an eddy of unnecessary discussion about this fascinating aspect of the story that should or needs to be emphasized, even if it's not the central question of the work. What might spark a lot of confusion, curiosity, or a moment of prurient interest in a writing workshop isn't enough to make a memoir interesting as a work in the world. Now that the world knows we exist, our memoirs have to work harder. 
We're freed of the need to prove our existence. Our memoirs are also challenged in exciting ways to continue to push it, to continue pushing the genre in terms of content and form. Escaping the pull of narrative form is as hard as shucking one's selfhood free of the constraints of the gender binary's false dichotomy. I'm speaking for myself here. I write memoir and essays, sometimes fiction, but the book I'm writing now is trying to capture an experience of my life before I consciously knew I was trans. I, of course, can emphasize what I perceive to be the evidence of my transness. I could emphasize my G.I. Joe doll and omit my Barbie. I could tell you about the toolbox my uncle made me and neglect to mention my love of horses and my tenderness for stuffed animals. I could tell you of the joy of being a child on the beach, flat-chested and shirtless, a perfect bubble that was pricked with the needle of my parents' self-consciousness, allowing all, all of the shame to flood in. I can tell you of my early sense of not right, fits pitched on Easter Sundays and ruffled dresses in a stuffy and crowded Catholic church. I could rebrand myself as having been a trans kid, and this wouldn't be a lie, but the language didn't exist then, even though I did. For the memoir I was workshopping, the not knowing is the important part, and the impact of violent death and the theme of being shaped by loss is, a so is the story I sought to tell. But as a trans writer, I get tangled in the kelp beds of perceived perception. Can my male authorhood tell my story of a gender nonconforming girlhood where the accepted community language of this current moment did not exist? Does the self as author always have to explain and account for the self as narrator slash character? How can I keep my transness from swamping a memoir that is not about my transition? How can I leave a trail of my gender through the story without making it the thing that takes over? Yes. <laughs> So I think that um, that question of language language not existing, even though you did, right? Like that's the that's the 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 the, the sort of eternal uh, feedback loop that that trans writers often get stuck in. It's like our language evolves in ways that uh, renders our past selves either more or less legible, more or less visible, and then you know if we if we tell our if we tell our tales, then people just want more of that instead of like all of the other pieces that make us who we are. Um, and I I think ju even just judging by the the claps and the the uh, you know everything else, I think um, that's obviously resonating with so many people. You know, this idea of having to having to perform a certain kind of narrative, right? Um, and what I love about this book, and I think other people are going to love as soon as they can get their hands on it, um, is that it just explodes that. It's like, yeah, we're fucking messy people. <laughs> like, everybody's messy. And I'm messier than most, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're the head of the messes, is that? <laughs> yeah. The pig yeah. dead, peanuts are the little, the little cloud of, yeah. Right uh, on. Psychically there at all times. Cool. <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I think that's great. So, I mean, I think, but I think the idea of like not having, as we get further away from the medical model, we get further away from these really um, basic coming out stories. We get a chance to kind of just be the messes that we are. Um, and that's, and then that again, it links us to the rest of humanity instead of trying to, you know, be a sort of plea for our, um for the right to be let in right it's like well we're in we're here so now what right. what else what other kind of stories can we tell and i think this book is really evidence of like well there's a lot of shit to talk about right even though a lot of these stories are tangentially at least about transness in some way they touch on the subject of transness they are about all of these other beautiful things and i think um what i kept coming back to is just like the big heartedness and the generosity of trying to live an authentic life in a world that really doesn't uh, reward that a lot of the time, you know, we are not taught in America to reward authenticity. And so it really is an outsider choice um, or an outlaw kind of choice. And uh, as, as like punk rock and, you know, all these things that you've been, the, the sort of through line of all of that is about trying to be true to yourself, you know, um, or figure out or be true to your people, you know, be true to the people you care about. Um, and I think that comes through in each of these essays. So, um, yeah, uh, I want to ask our, ask our questions, um, from our, from the peanut gallery. So, um, the way this works is that folks, uh, can like upvote them. So, the first one is obviously the most important. It's from Julie Perini, and she just asked, "How did you become so awesome?" <laughs> <laughs> um, I think 
um, I'm only uh, I'm I'm elevated by the awesomeness of people around me, including Julie Perini, who's an incredible filmmaker, incredible human being, incredible activist, um, and uh, yeah, prison abolitionist, and uh, yeah. So <laughs> Rachel's here. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm only I'm only as awesome as the the people around me, you know. So, so Natalia Vigil um, asked, could you speak a bit about your journey to writing this book? I think you you pretty well have uh, answered that. Um, Jennifer Baumgartner oh, yeah. at, <laughs> asked, uh, given that you've been a writer for so long, what was different about writing a book? I don't know. Um, you know, can you say just a little bit about your practice or your sort of writerly habits? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it feels different to have a book. I was very nervous before this. I was like, all day, I was like, Oh my God, is this normal? And I asked, I don't know if uh, Jordy's on the call, but uh, I asked I asked Jordy Rosenberg, I was like, is this normal to feel like you want to run and hide and you're going to puke? <laughs> um, because it feels different, you know, as opposed to like a, a piece in a lit journal or a piece published online in a lit journal or in an anthology. Um, um, and it feels awesome, but also terrifying, you know? Um, I think for this book, I thought, well, it's kind of an easy book because most of it's written, you know, but thanks to Larissa and, and Jennifer and Kate and everybody at, at Daughter, um, you know, we really went through a lot of work on this book to to really kind of weave it into something way better than I anticipated it being. Um, and so I really, I think that the the book is is what it is thanks to their vision um and their ability to kind of get what i was going for and make a lot of really great suggestions for how to do it better so um yeah and um yeah and i think you know I, i've published in a bunch i think i'm publishing 13 anthologies and a bunch of places but uh a book is a different thing you know a book is is a is a is a different kind of uh output you know um so I'm excited to see what it feels like to to be booked out in the world to have a to have a book and um you know but there's always this part of me you know because i i i think i i'm not alone probably in this but i exist in kind of a constant state of uh imposter syndrome um and insecurity about like when am i going to feel like i'm really a real writer um you know I, th I, I thought well maybe i'll feel like a real writer when i have a book published you know and then i have a feeling that i'll probably at some point decide to have a neur neuroses around like, well, maybe I'll feel like a real writer when the second book comes out or the third book. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it will never go away. Um, and that's some of that, uh, that I think that striving or yearning, which, um, you know, I should lean back onto that Buddhist practice to, to kind of address, because I think that's about a, a, a deeper issue than the issue of writing. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that brings up actually one of the things that I think, there's a lot in this book that I hope people will take away from um, that we're not going to get to tonight, but about trauma and about accountability and about healing and about all these things about, about how you heal within community, how you heal yourself. And writing is the way writing is the practice. Writing is one of the things that we do to find our, find our values, find our sense of self, find our sense of accountability to, to ourselves and one another. And so I think to me, that is always, um, that's, that's very clear in here is that along with all these other practices of, you know, coming to, coming to understand yourself, it's like the writing is the digging. Right. Um, and I think that's, um, that's what makes it so important. Um, which maybe is why you want to puke a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, mean, uh, I, I think through the process of writing, I'm much better, um, taking my time. Like if you asked me these questions and I could go away and sit and think about them for three weeks and write you a response and probably have a more articulate, um, eloquent response, you know what I mean? Cause that's where I do my, my best thinking. It helps me kind of, uh, helps my brain kind of see through the parts a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, so Jade Fox asked, how long did you take to write Pass with Care and how did you get past the fears of offending folks in your life story? Am I past it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm past it. Um, yeah, and I get I, like kind of what I was saying earlier on. I think that idea that if if um you know trying to make sure that the weight 
of what I'm flaying on the page is, is myself. Um, that's I'm trying to make sure that um, I'm, I'm investigating myself more than anyone else. Um, you know, and when I've met very few true villains in my life, you know, um, and I think when we um, make somebody into a villain on the page, it rings for the most part really false. Um, and the idea is like, you know, I'm trying to get at something through myself. And so again, I don't live in a world alone, you know, like I live in a world full of other people, which makes it both great to write about and also really difficult. Um, and I think part of the question was how long did the book take to write? Um, well, before I, before I get, I change the subject. Um, you know, I, I think a lot like this, this, these questions come up a lot when I'm teaching and there are so many different schools of thought about it. Um, you know, like Mary Carr in her wonderful art of memoir book, um, talks about how she'll show parts of a book that pertain to a person to that person before she ever goes forward and publishes it. Um, you know, and if somebody's like really is um, in disagreement about something, like that's not the way I remember it going down, she, she won't include it. Um, you know, and then there's, I think it was like Anne Lamont, maybe who said like, if people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better. So there's <laughs> like, polls that, you know, of, of people and ways of thinking about it, you know, um, some, one of my mentors in my MFA program, you know, talked a lot about, well, like, you, you know, you're stuck with your family your whole life, you have to look at them, you know, so um you know who are you who are you going to respect and honor in, in the process so you know there's a lot of choices to make about it and i think um yeah I, i'm for myself just trying to find the balance of of how do i tell my own story that obviously involves other human beings um without um being needlessly and mindlessly hurtful or making other people look stupid or foolish or or whatever, you know, because that's not what I'm here to do. And, you know, and again, like the culture that I come from, there's so much, uh, you know, so much architecture around silence. And so the idea of writing about my own life is already breaking a million taboos. And from where I grew up, my Aunt Mary's on the call, I think. So she knows, like we, like it's so taboo to talk about yourself, to talk about your family business and all that. So, uh, so I think there's, you know, a need for me to push back against that because there's ways in which that culture has negatively shaped me and it's negatively shaped my parents and, and my extended family. Um, so yeah, and then how long this book took both two years and 20 years to write. So um, some of the earlier pieces in, in this book were um, things that I was performing with Sister Spit, um, you know, 20 something years ago and, um, and like I said, the process with Daughter Press, this bale of hay of a manuscript that I presented to them that was like a total mess. Um, you know, we've worked really hard over the past couple of years to to bring it to into into shape. So hey, um, <laughs> thanks for your question. There's, <laughs> there's a, a somewhat follow-up question to that, which was which were the scariest parts of this book to write and which part gave you the most courage and pride? That's from Sam Patton. Wow. Thanks, San. Hi. Um, <sighs> yeah, I think the, the piece about community accountability was definitely the most nerve wracking and, and personally uh, challenging piece. And it's the newest piece in the book. Um, kind of looking at um, the culture of call it culture and how we, um, you know, how we come back from mistakes, how we grow, how do we, how do we, know when somebody has grown or changed um you know i think writing about that was very um terrifying and and felt very vulnerable to do um yeah was there and um, what was the other part what, what gave you the most pride like what were you what felt the best hmm. um kind of seeing how the whole thing shaped up as a, as a whole i think uh makes me really proud and again i feel like that's as much uh, Larissa and Jennifer as it, as it was me um, um, that, you know, I, a couple weeks ago I sat down and just uh, hadn't picked up the, the galley that I have um, in a while. And I just sat down and read the whole thing. And I had this feeling of like, 
who wrote this? Like, where did this even come? Where did this come from? I don't know. Um, and and just kind of seeing it, how how it, it's cohered as a whole, um, I, I feel really proud of and uh, really grateful for the the efforts of uh, the team at Daughter for that. Yeah. Um, so Marty Korea, I apologize if I am mispronouncing your name. Hey, Marty. Marty. Uh, <laughs> while writing the book, what kinds of intersections came up around queerness, transness, working classness, artsiness, kick-assness, et cetera? How did areas of your identities melded and what about the ones that clashed? What surprises were there? So, um, you know, did that, do you, do you get the gist of the question? Yeah, that's a huge question. And Marty is a beautiful writer. Um, and somebody who was, uh, you know, when, when I was really young, I think Marty and I are probably the same age, but it, Marty was like a, you know, a, a, a queer possibility model for me. And, uh, and when I was young and just, uh, I thought Marty was like the coolest. And, um, and so uh, it's really nice that you're here. Um, um, God, yeah, I don't even know where to tuck into that question. Cause it's so, it's so big. <laughs> um, I don't know, Errol, can you help me with an entry point for it? I just, I feel like I don't know where to start. <laughs> yeah, just so, um, so Marty is asking like, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it. Like, were there any sort of interesting or surprising places where your identities intersected or clashed? I think is really the gist of the question. So yeah. like things that came up that you were like, huh, all right. Yeah, I think I think one interesting thing is just kind of seeing how like things are always in flux. And so there's this sort of sense of like, you know, as we age, maybe we become more solidified in our, our identity, but at the same time, things are always changing, you know? And so um, like my relationship with my parents changed through the time of writing, you know, where, where, the, where the writing in this book first starts and where it ends. Um, you know, my parents class really, they transitioned from working to, to middle class in within my childhood. Um, my sort of sense of um, masculinity where like, I felt like it was my part-time job when I was a butch, like it was something I just felt like I had to really put so much effort into and like wear, like it wore me. And as much as I love and completely revere my butch history and, and butches and in general, um, um, and how much that, you know, which identity means to me, um, you know, there was also a way in which it waited on me, you know, and I think you were talking about that era where it's like, um, not really realizing like how, you know, burdensome it is to be basically a gender nonconforming person. Um, you know, and then there's other things that really surprised me too. Like uh, a few years ago, I was um, at a, a talk at Reed College with, um, Kimberly Pierce, who, you know, directed Boys Don't Cry. And there just happened to be like a protest by the students against Kimberly Pierce. And it was so strange to me um, because, you know, my history with that film is like, yeah, I never thought it was a perfect film, but the representation of that film was like the first thing I knew of where there was representation of us where we weren't like a, a kind of like sorted punchline or, you know, um, and at the same time, I think the younger people who were protesting the film didn't really quite have the context for that, you know, for that. So it was, there were so many like missed opportunities in it. But one thing that really struck me as strange was that it seemed that the students weren't seeing Kimberly Pierce as a gender nonconforming person. That's how I read Kimberly Pierce as a butch. I was like, this is a gender nonconforming person who, um, you're calling a, a cis white bitch. And I'm like, there's something misfires here, even though the critiques that the students had and their questions were incredibly valuable questions, right? Like they weren't easy questions, but their questions were really valid. And so um, the way in which uh, like the, the, the event sort of, the protest was sort of framed as an attack like i think you know and those kinds of things i'm like um I, I think that we have a lot of tools at our disposal but sometimes we only think we have the cannon or the battering ram you know and it's like you don't always need the battering ram you don't always need to like blow shit up like but the the point of the conversation the every single question students had i thought was really um you know pretty valid you know um 
So I, I think that kind of, I think that idea where we've gotten to a place where maybe some people see um, masculine of center women or gender nonconforming people as not gender nonconforming is like a different, I'm like, whoa, I'm, <laughs> I'm reading this person in a really particular way. And, um, and maybe they're just like, Hey, we have a, a short haired lesbian on TV on Ellen. So it's like, I, I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking, but it's, um, I'm rambling. <laughs> no, I think uh, one of the, one of the, um, pieces that that's a really pivotal piece in this, um, in the book, the, the fourth level, you, you really, the, the sort of jewel at the center of this is the need to ask the question why, like, like at the end of the day, so much could be helped or, or healed if we just asked each other, like, why did this, why did this harm happen? Or what were you thinking when this happened? Or what was going through your heart, you know, um, when this hard thing was occurring, right? Or like, what was your experience of this situation, right? And we so often just jump to like our, our guesses or our, you know, um, our assumptions about about who someone is or you know how you know we read somebody in some kind of way and just decide that that they are acting in a way that's causing harm without having all the information and without ever asking them why right mm -hmm. um and i think what you're saying about those students that that's what that brings up for me and so i think so many pieces in this book are are sort of a reminder to to ask more questions and make fewer assumptions um, and just be like, huh, why, <laughs> why? Um, I, we're coming to the end of our time. So I want to, um, I want to ask one more question here. So how did you decide on the parts that were necessary to writing your memoir and pieces that were maybe emotionally and personally significant, but didn't move the story you wanted to tell along? So basically, was there anything that you cut out um or you know that that you had to write through maybe um that didn't make it in the book that's from zoe copweber okay i was like i was like it was one of my students writing that question <laughs> i was like karma um yeah that's a great question i think that um you know an important thing and this is probably like a brene brown thing i'm stealing or something but um you know i, I think it was her who was talking about this idea of like not putting forward um like publicly um, something that you haven't fully processed yourself, right? And I think I see it a lot with, um, you know, my undergrad, like, um, you know, first or second year writing students where, um, you know, because a, a critique on the, on the page becomes a critique on the person. And I think I kind of getting at that a little bit too in the, in the throwing sheet over the ghost essay too, of, um, um, you know, thinking that and this goes back to you know the, the spoken spoken word performance stuff where it's just like raw shotgun blast of like my trauma my my unexamined stuff just getting it out there um you know the um the need for that sort of like um continuum of feedback the feedback loop of uh readership or workshop feedback or audience um you know i think you know kind of trying to figure out like is this something that I'm ready to have critiqued as a piece of art, as opposed to somebody critiquing my personal self, my personal experience? Um, yeah, and I think it's it, uh, as a kind of ADD person who finds a lot of things really interesting or hilarious. Um, you know, there's that need too to kind of like have outside eyes of like, you know, this isn't feeding the the main branches of the story. These are little suckers that need to get cut away so that these parts can flourish, you know what I mean? And, um, and I have to remind myself too that I, I don't need to tell every story in this piece. I don't need to tell every story in this book. I don't need to tell every story. Nobody needs to tell every story. So like, what, what can I kind of sift out that will let something more uh, meaningful come to the surface? It's That's great. so hard. <laughs> it's it hard. It's really yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, because I am a bookseller, I always want to um, ask like what you're what you're reading and um, if you have any book recommendations for other people. Oh my God, I have so many recommendations. Get a pen. Um, All right, lay them on us. Uh, I just finished reading Later by Paul Lisicki, which is amazing. Um, and I think I saw Paul in here maybe a minute ago. I thought he was here, yeah. Yeah, was, uh, great. Um, 
what else? Um, I just started reading Black on Both Sides by C. Riley Snorton. Um, I, what else? Oh, I'm reading, um, I just finished reading Funeral Rites by Jean Genet, which was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. Um, I think it's a mood, right? Um, what else? I fin just finished reading um, We Both Laughed in Pleasure, The Diaries of Lou Sullivan, which uh, if you're hungry for trans ancestors, it is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, beautifully edited. Hey, Paul. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, I, I'll stop there, but I always have like a gajillion, follow me on Goodreads or something because I'm, yeah, I'm always posting when I'm reading up there. I love it. Um, cool. Well, so what, um, you, what, it, what are you reading right now? What would you recommend? Um, I am reading actually, uh, this book by Michael McDowell, who is a gay, uh, Alabamian who, um, died of AIDS actually. And, um, it is, it was out of print. It's got a terrible, uh, well, I shouldn't say terrible cover, but, uh, it's, <laughs> the cover makes it look, um, it's huge. less exciting than it is. Yeah. It's huge. It was published as a serialized novel. Um, in the eighties and it's basically wow. this like queer Southern Gothic, uh, set in Alabama about mm. this, this like family, uh, of matriarchs and the, and a woman who comes to town, who's a river monster and infiltrates the family. <laughs> and it's, a, it's basically a parable about Southern culture. Um, and it's great. It's d very diverting right now. I'm loving it. So oh my God. yeah, highly it's recommended. Water. It's called Blackwater by Michael McDowell. Cool. So um, it is my job to encourage y'all, if you enjoyed this conversation, to please consider making a donation to Kara Circle. Kara Circle is our nonprofit programming arm. Um, we are primarily individually donor funded. So that's how we put on all of these conversations. We would love, 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 uh, you know, for your, for whatever you are able to do. Um, it really does make a huge difference um, and allows us to do more of these. Um, and Jennifer is pitching in right now, which we appreciate. She's not a plant. We didn't tell her to do that. So thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody in the, in the comments. It's really, this format is, you know, it's pretty cool because we actually kind of get to have a, 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 a conversation with the audience, even though it's in text. Um, I think it's, it's a fun way to do this. So if you enjoy it, I hope you'll come back to some of our other events. Um, all of our Keras events are on the, um, the Keras homepage and we'd love for you to just, uh, keep, keep coming back with us. Um, cause we're doing these almost every day. Uh, and it's a way to stay connected in this hard time. Uh, Coop, you have always been one of my queer and trans possibility models. So it is a real honor to um, get to have this conversation with you. I know many other people feel this way too. I hope folks will hang out and look back at the chat, but um, I hope everybody will stay safe and healthy and well uh, and buy Cooper's book right here on this link because you want it to be sent to you. And he's, we're doing, um, Cooper's doing book plates so that your book will be signed if you buy it from Karis. So yeah. even more reason to get it from us thank you thanks, so much carol and thanks for uh Karis for hosting me and i can't wait to come see you in person it will happen one of these days yes thank for you. sure all right everybody be well be safe thank you bye-bye okay. bye thank you